Welcome to Generative Age, a podcast that explores the rapidly evolving world of generative AI and its impact on education. Guided by our expert facilitators, Alana Winnick and Dr. Cameron Fajo, we speak with practitioners and thought leaders in education who are shaping the course of generative AI in the classroom. Whether you're an educator, administrator, technology leader, or simply interested in the future of education, join us on this journey through the Generative Age. Powered by NYSTATE, the New York State Association for Computers and Technologies in Education. Join us as we explore the cutting edge of creativity and all the ways in which generative AI is changing the face of education. Welcome. Amy, since you're on, do you want want to have the pleasure? I would love to. So this is our fourth or fifth? Fifth. Our fifth. Fifth. Wow. So this is our fifth in a series on generative AI that's facilitated by Alana Winnick and Cameron Fajo. And we have had people from all over the globe join these discussions, which has really just been amazing. And I was actually sharing with somebody today, <clears throat> the one that um, Tim Needles was on, there's AI that is popping up in different areas that we just have no idea. And I think this is really just, it's a tip of the iceberg. And I am so thrilled that we have so many people um, that are exploring and are taking the risk. And one of which is our own Mary Howard from Grand Island. And Mary's been part of the Nice Geek team for many years now. And she is a recently published author. And she's going to be sharing some information on that today. So Mary, I just want to thank you so much for joining. And this has been just a, a tremendous discussion along. So welcome to the fifth uh, installment. And we're thrilled that you're here. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Make sure I use the chat if you're here with us live and tell us what you've tried with generative AI since our last session. So if you've used it at all, please let us know um, how you've used it. Great. So I'll jump in here. We've got the roadmap as we do for every session. So we will give our landscape update and then we're very pleased to welcome Mary Howard and she'll walk through uh, Streamline Your Teacher Life. After that, we will do a Q&A and we'll then jump into breakout sessions where it's your chance to connect with others in this space and learn about what they're doing and their challenges and areas of exploration. Uh, We will then wrap up and invite you to our next session, which will take place in June. So here's a part where we update you and we haven't seen you in quite a bit of time. So things have changed a lot as they always do in the rapidly evolving world of generative AI. Um, Google had a really big announcement this week, or it was last week, I guess, technically. They had a keynote. It was about three hours long or something. So I put a little summary video for you there, and I'm just going to share some highlights. So with some new features that you're going to see coming out directly embedded into the Google tools is Help Me Write, which is in Gmail. And you just have to write a prompt, and then it writes an elaborate Gmail for you that you can then edit and tweak and make your own. And they also have helped me organize in sheets and presentations. So you can write a prompt of maybe a type of spreadsheet you want to create. And then it creates this whole template um, with different categories and rows and columns that it thinks you might want. And again, you could tweak it based on what you're what you want. And then they have this similar thing in presentation, or I should say Google Slides, and they have you can have it create speaker notes for you, which I thought was pretty interesting, except I don't know, I usually just speak out of my head, but I thought that was a pretty cool feature. Uh, Project Tailwind is where you can insert your notes and your documents and spreadsheets from Google Drive, and then it inserts them into an AI generated notebook based on your notes. So you get to pick and choose the files that you want, and then it creates this notebook for you with your notes. Google Photos has magic eraser, so you can erase from the pictures, which you were always able to do, but you could also like move it. So if you're in a scene and you want to move yourself a little to the right or left, you can you can actually move yourself. And that's with the magic editor. And there is an Adobe Firefly integration, which I thought was really cool as well. But Adobe Firefly is a standalone software also, and you could join that beta. I put a link for you, but I just wanted to connect it to Google because it is tied together with Google as well. Then there's Bard Code, which allows you to generate debug and explains code for you. And they have 20 languages. So if you're teaching coding, you can have it generate code or debug your code, or it actually, if you don't understand code, you can say, help me understand this and it will help you understand it. And then there's Bard Tools. And the big one is visuals. So 
you can upload an image and then ask it to describe the image or interact with the image that you upload, or you can ask it to, to provide you images in a response. So it, it analyzes the images as prompts and it gives you images as responses. So those are just some new things that you'll see being released with Google in the upcoming weeks, months, days, who knows. And then on the chat GPT open AI side, we've seen a couple of new uh, releases Actually, um, OpenAI did two releases for ChatGPT within the past two weeks. So um, one of the big ones that is available to GPT Plus members is the beta browsing option. And so what that does is it actually takes in your prompt or your question, and then it will run a series. It'll actually go out to the web, perform the search, and then fold that into the responses. So if you have that membership, I encourage you to take a look at it. It does provide sources, so it will do citations for the information that it provides when you use that new feature. And so that's an additional option. Another option that's available is the plugins feature, which is in beta. And that's something where you're able to access information using different third-party services that is um, available. You have to sign up to join the beta list to get involved in that. So for those of you who are able to get in there, um, feel free to throw in the chat what that experience has been like for you. Um, when I know a few people have been poking around in it and really seem to like it a lot. The third addition here is being able to export all of your chats. Uh, it's really nice. It just pulls it out and it gives you a nice web page, And now you can see all of that, those months and months of chat prompts in one specific, one particular place. So I think that that's um, going to be really important once, you know, there's a tool that's compliant with Edlaw 2D because if students are using it for their work and we hope that they do, you can ask the student to submit the exported chat along with their assignment so you can see how they're using the tool and what types of prompts that they're using. And I see Mary shaking her head. She's probably going to go into that in a little while. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And then we do have some new resources. Well, one of them is old. So the Day of AI is coming up on May 18th. So make sure that you celebrate the Day of AI. And you can register and receive a link to the Day of AI curriculum, which is free. And you don't need to do it on May 18th. You could do it any day you want. There's also teachai.org, which is going to have policy recommendations, global framework, and public engagements, and much, much more. And there's a lot of partners, including ISTE and other organizations. So I gave you a link to sign up to get updates. And it's not launched yet, but I signed up because I want to know um, what they're recommending. Because over the summer, I'm definitely going to be revising my policies in my school district. And I just want to see what the recommendations are. So I just want to share that with you as well. And speaking of uh, policies and recommendations, I found the University of Missouri's Office of Academic Integrity had a sample AI position statement. So I just wanted to share that with you to see an example of how your school or district or classroom can create a position statement on how AI could or should be used in your classroom or your school. And then a tool that one of my teachers shared with me last week was called Twee, and it's an AI-powered tool for English teachers. And she she was going to be absent. She's like, I just took a YouTube video and I popped it in and gave all these interactive questions for the kids to do while I'm out. So she was really obsessed with it. And I just wanted to share that with you. It's awesome. And so um, along those lines of really great resources is this UNESCO chat GPT guide. There are a lot of different publications coming out. I like this one because of the different roles that it has in the document for different ways for teachers to use generative AI. And I know Mary is going to walk us through quite a few more ways. And so this is, it's a really short introduction to that. So I encourage all of our participants to check that out. Um, we also just put the slides in. We Our participant number is growing quite a bit since we started. So Glad to see all you, all the new people joining us. And with that, I think we are now transitioning to the main event.
Yes, I'm so, so excited to welcome Mary Howard. She is a national board certified teacher, which I've learned from one of my own teachers going through this process. It is quite the rigorous process. So that those four letters mean a lot for anyone that doesn't know that. She's a sixth grade teacher at Grand Island Central School District. She was two, wow, two times. I didn't know that. Teacher of the year finalist twice, Mary. I didn't know that one. She I was, was a bridesmaid, never a bride, I guess. <laughs> but two times, that's a really, that's a really big deal. 2018 ISTE Virtual Pioneer of the Year, New York State Master Teacher, and she runs the TED Talk program for NiceGate, which you didn't put in there, but I think it's a really awesome thing that you do. And she also, very exciting, is a new published author. So that's a, why she's with us here today. And we're actually going to, before I hand it over, we're going to be raffling off a free book. So make sure when you navigate to this slide deck, if you're here live, you click on either the word book or raffle and you enter into the raffle. And at the end, we're going to pick a winner and you're going to get a copy of Mary's book, Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask... Mary to take over, and we welcome you, Mary, to the Generative Age. Thank you very much. So to those of you unfamiliar with Grand Island, because I know we're not all from New York State, and even if we are from New York State, sometimes Western New York seems like it's kind of off in the off in the Wahoo wilderness, um, far, far away. A Grand Island is an island shaped like a pork chop that's right near Niagara Falls. So I'm on the far western edge of New York State. And um, the title of the book is Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life. And I like how Cameron added in their teacher slash administrator life. It's not uh, an exclusive club. The teacher club. It includes everyone. And uh, the tools and things shared in the book really are for anyone. And this is a really exciting time. Even just seeing, Alana, what you were just sharing with, you know, all the new tools and the new updates and things like that. For those of you that have been around a while, 2006 was Web 2.0 tools. There was this massive explosion of these things called Web 2.0 tools, which hit education and education technology. And I can't help that this reminds me so much of that time. You know, we were learning about how to, you know, make mind maps. That was like the big deal back then, like how to make a mind map or how to make a Wix or a Wiki or all these other things. And that is happening now too. This seems like another revolution in educational technology. So um, what I'm going to go through today is I'm going to just give you an idea, kind of peek behind the cover of the book and give you some tips and some strategies of how, you know, I've been using ChatGPT in my classroom to support my instruction. And the links in the presentation are clickable so that if you, you know, want any of the materials, it will take you to those sites and those places. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we're signing up for the book raffle. Um, I do think of this phrase, anything you can do, I can do better. And then, of course, question marks. So artificial intelligence kind of exudes that exudes that um, that idea that, you know, can it do things better than us? Um, and yeah, in a lot of ways it can. And so when I sat down to pen this book, that was my premise. That was my argument that uh, teacher burnout is the highest it's been in five years, according to the National Education Institute. And they're leaving the profession in droves. And all of a sudden, of course, AI emerges on the scene. And you think to yourself, is this the savior? Is this the thing that can lift the load so that teachers aren't burning out and teachers aren't losing the profession? And so when I wrote the book, I wanted to exclusively write through that lens. How can we leverage artificial intelligence, specifically chat GPT, to do all of those mundane tasks that we might need support with? And so the book is organized from the beginning to be user friendly and face a user who might not be familiar with the tool itself. It talks about chat GPT as a tool. What is it? How is it trained? Where did it come from? Who owns it? How do you access it? And then it proceeds to start talking about artificial intelligence in education. Why use artificial intelligence? And there is this moment of revelation where we realize we've been using it all along. 
to support us in a lot of ways. It just didn't have uh, the fancy name. It didn't have the sparkles that it seems to have right now, you know, but we've been using adaptive learning tools and, you know, we've been using self-grading um, websites and, and those types of um, applications. So it's been there kind of, uh, you know, just, just the very beginning, very baby AI, but it's been there helping us out all along. And then we proceed to talk about how to use it, you know, how to access the tool, and some of the limitations and prompting strategies. And so, you know, with our limited time that we have together, I kind of wanted to just focus on things that I thought would be most useful to the people watching, especially when we're talking about so many other tools that are out there that are doing very similar things. And the number one thing that I hear people talk about in a lot of forums that I follow and Facebook groups um, is prompting strategies. You know, there is this, this old adage, it goes way back to 1956 when they were first programming computers. If you put garbage into a computer, you are going to get garbage out. That same premise applies to artificial intelligence. If you put a poor prompt in or don't ask your question correctly, you are likely to not get quality information back. But I preface that by saying there are some times you're going to put good stuff in in your prompts and you're still going to get garbage back. So on the screen is a prompting strategy that I've been using and it's working really quite well. Um, there are lots of different theories out there about the best way to, to prompt AI or BARD or GPT, whatever you're planning on using. And what I've had success with is that idea of giving it a perspective. I've been telling ChatGPT, you know, to act as though they are a sixth grade teacher or act as a third grade teacher. And that's been help, helping to create the perspective or the lens through which my response comes back through, um, through the tool. And then I articulate my task. I tell it what I want it to do. I say, you know, make me a rubric or create a list, create a QR code. Just before the session, I was playing around with, yeah, ChatGPT can make QR codes. And, and I found that really helpful. It's really fast and easy. So you tell the task what you want, and then you're specific about the topic. What is the topic that you're looking for? So if you're writing me a reading passage, that's the task, write that reading passage on the states of matter or write a series of questions that are math related and focus on this particular topic. So with that three-prong approach, I've been pretty lucky. It's been working really well. However, naturally, you need to be guarded. Nobody's gonna, no one should copy right out of the tool and paste it into any site or resource. You really need to make sure you're always proofreading what you get back, always adapting what you get back, and modifying it. If only, if not only for the fact that um, you know, it's not your work. It's it's artificial intelligence's work. You want it to have your voice and show, you know, your thought and everything else. So you're always going to want to make sure you're looking at what you're getting back. And also, sometimes it's garbage out. Sometimes you don't get back quality information. And I think those of us that have been around now, AI for the last few months, we've seen it. And we've seen it happen again and again. You ask for something and it makes something up, or you, you know, ask for um you know, a list of something, or you give it a list to, to modify and suddenly it's changed. So, or it stops halfway through. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but I've had it processing things and boop, it just stops. And I'm like, oh, where's the rest of the chat GBT? So these things do happen. So in the book, the, the primary role of the book was use case scenarios. You know, I'm a sixth grade teacher. I teach science and I teach ELA. Um, I always say I'm just a sixth grade teacher. You know, I'm, I'm in the trenches with the kiddos. And um, so I'm, I'm walking the walk with a lot of teachers. So I wanted the framework to kind of follow what an effective classroom is needs and does. And so the research, um, I've been really fond of Harvey Silver. If you're not familiar with Harvey Silver, he is a, a professional development provider, but he also runs a website called The Thoughtful Classroom. And he has quite a few materials on uh, educator effectiveness. And his idea is that The Thoughtful Classroom stands on four cornerstones. You have an organization, you have rules and procedures, you have engagement, and you promote a culture of thinking and learning. And so the chapters are kind of indirectly aligned to these four cornerstones. So as you're going through it, you're going to see that there's an entire section on how you can utilize ChatGPT to support organizing things in your class. You're going to see another section that talks about your procedural things. Again, I said mundane tasks, and there's nothing more mundane than a lot of that procedural stuff that teachers need to do. 
And then we go into some engagement things. We talk about things that ChatGPT can return to you that you might not have thought of that can really rock your classroom. And then in the end, that culture of thinking and learning is pretty much everywhere. You know, the things that you're pulling out of it are going to support your pedagogy and support your instruction. So the next part is really that bottomless well that we've all been discovering of the things that it can do for us. I obviously can't go through every possible use case scenario um, that could possibly be generated through JetGPT. So I really just kind of try to focus people on, you know, that like you said, Alana, the tip of the iceberg, you know, start finding that, you know, utilization that you can do with it to support you, to streamline your life, to take away those tasks that are requiring a lot of load. And so, yes, it can generate lesson plans for you. And um, I found it's helpful in those times where I just, uh, the light bulb's just not going off. You know, I, I know I need to do something, but it can generate a lesson plan with a step-by-step -step suggestions on how to implement the plan. What I find when I do it is I'm picking and choosing. Yeah, don't like that. Oh, that's a really good idea. I didn't think of that. So it does support lesson planning. Standards alignment is one of those things that a lot of times in our busy lives, we write, a, we write our lesson and off we go. And then it's time for observation. And they're like, well, what are the standards that this is aligned to? And then we stop and you go, oh gosh, okay, I have to pull the standards. I have to look for it. I have to you know, figure this out and I have to write them down. You know, We know we're teaching with a path in mind, but sometimes we get stuck. So ChatGPT did a really great job in several of my lessons in returning the next gen science standards. I said you know, something about Newton's laws and I put it in and boom, it gave me the standards. So I was very impressed with that skill. I felt like that was a really good lift for a lot of educators. Um, the, its power to work with lists of information continues to blow my mind. And that's whether it's creating a list of information for you uh, to support you in some way, or you're putting in a list of information into chat GPT and it works with that list for you. And I think this is a very uh, under discussed um, point when it comes to AI, you know, we're calling it generative AI. So we're thinking, okay, it's generating all of the materials, but uh, on the contrary, it's very good at organizing things that you have and evaluating materials that you put into it. And so when I've been working with it, creating lists of information, um, it's been able to format lists of materials for me in a table format, separate columns and tables so that I don't have to you know, go in and do cell by cell by cell, blending information, alphabetizing information. You know, its ability to work with lists is quite amazing. And it, it by itself, you know, it has an entire chapter in the book just because it is really a powerful aspect of the tool. We all work with vocabulary in education and lots of acronyms. And it is very good at providing definitions for you, generating acronyms for you. If you're someone who needs an acronym for something, it can generate that for you or give you some ideas. So it's really good at working with vocabulary. You know, it's a language processing machine. And this is a, a one of its strengths, this is its ability to work with vocabulary. And um, if you're not familiar with culture of um, pedagogy, um, Jennifer Gonzalez, you should be. Uh, she is a wonderful public speaker and um, a passionate educator, and she has a great blog. And Jennifer Gonzalez, Culture of Pedagogy, was the first one that, that kind of looked at ChatGPT as a tool for generating examples. And her blog on this topic is is outstanding. And she talks about, I think she actually had a guest blogger support her on that particular one. And she talks about how, you know, sometimes we're just at a loss of examples and we need ChatGPT to be our brainstorming storming machine. And so whether that comes through, you know, I need a bunch of examples for a math class or a bunch of examples of kinetic energy for a science class, or I need some examples of poetry, you know, that fits this category. It's great at generating examples. So that's something else to keep in mind. Um, reading passages and generating questions. This was the hook for me when I first started. I needed a reading passage and then I thought, well, that was cool. And that's really appropriate for my grade level, but I have to differentiate. I have students that can't read at high of the level. So I said, you write, rewrite it again, but lower the reading level. And, and it did. And then I asked it to pull some uh, vocabulary out that I could use as separate questions. And it, it zoned in on those, you know, important vocabulary. And then, of course, I wanted some true or false questions, some fill in the blank questions, some multiple choice questions, and boom, it made those. And then, so this is the zone where a lot of teachers fall in love. 
<laughs> and then finally, grading rubrics. So here I have seven examples on this slide, but there are truly, truly endless possibilities. And um, you know, the book really outlines as much as I possibly can when it comes to use case examples to support a teacher in the classroom. The latter chapters of the book dive more deeply into maybe a little more philosophy. And, and uh, I said to Alana, I thought this might be kind of fun for us to talk about today while we're together. You know, th there is an AI debate that's happening. And because I wrote the book through the lens of how it can help the teacher, I only danced around the surface of student use. And my rationale for that for that wasn't wasn't fear and wasn't because I don't want them to use it. I'm, I strongly advocate, you know, instructional technology. That is the the Kool Aid that I've been drinking from for the past you know 16 years, you know. But I was guarded because it was new and because my students are 12 and because we do have you know privacy laws and we have kind of some unknowns out there when it comes to what these companies are doing with this data. So I suggest some ways that AI can be used by teachers and students within the classroom, but I don't dive too deeply into that topic because I do think, I think it's still a very um, questionable topic. And I, I think there's a lot of discussion and debate that still needs to happen. And so if you have not seen this video yet, you need to take some time to see the Socrates Bill Gates debate. Um, I believe it was produced by Midjourney AI. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Midjourney produced it. And it's a complete artificial intelligence conversation between Bill and Socrates. And they're going back and forth debating uh, the pros and cons of artificial intelligence. Um, and the two quotes that really stood out the most to me were Bill Gates' perspective is that, you know, here, here we have AI and AI is this magnifying glass and it's going to help us as humans see the world more clearly and, you know, lift the load of these mundane tasks and help us make more informed decisions and essentially elevate us. Um, I added in there the fact that I really believe it's going to support more discourse and conversation. You know, my argument with use of AI in the classroom is that if you are a teacher and you're using questioning strategies that can easily be answered through AI, well, they could have also been answered with an encyclopedia and they could have also been answered with Google. So you need to modify and change the way you're asking questions. And I think discourse and conversation are going to find their way back into the classroom more and more because we, you know, students' opinion and those reflective skills are way more powerful and way more valuable than just spitting and spewing out content information. Then on the Socrates side, Socrates, of course, is much more guarded. While he would love the fact that, you know, discourse is being encouraged as a result of AI, Socrates argues that AI will make us complacent. And he uses this beautiful allegory about a tree. And he says that, you know, that just as the tree grows strong um, roots, it, it needs to be buffeted by the wind, you know, and, and we need to do these mundane tasks and wrestle with these mundane tasks because the in, in the end, they make us stronger. And so, you know, depending on your perspective and where you land, I think it makes for some really good debate. You know, I think both have really good points and um, I think it's yet to be determined. Of course, I fall on the, the side of Bill Gates with a, maybe a little bit of Socrates in there, but um you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. We have so much growth and so much future with AI. It's a really, really exciting thing. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have thank any questions. you. That was, uh, that was my slide to say thank you, Mary. <laughs> We're so lucky to have you on. That was really great. And I don't know if you saw it in the chat, but um, Jamie said that she's actually using this book with her teachers. So um, I just wanted to share that with you so you knew that your book is actually being used in a school district and they're in this room right now. That's very cool. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. And if school districts want to use the book too, um, in the slide deck, there is a free professional development packet that outlines the each chapter and is and it has um it's a free download and it has questions that correlate with every single chapter and there's four types of questions for that pd so there's knowledge based questions on the chapters there's reflection questions you know there's all sorts of um questions to support each chapter and it could be used as you know synchronous or asynchronous or even just as a book study or a, a personal uh journey to investigate the book and have a little bit more guidance so that's in there as a download if you're in 
interested in that too. Does yeah. anyone have any questions or takeaways? We love your takeaways. So if everyone just take a minute in the chat and just write your biggest takeaway from the session. And if you have any questions, and then we'll ask you a couple questions. So back to the thing I brought up in the beginning, the National Board Certification. So as you know, you know, it's a really rigorous process. And I'm learning about this through one of my teachers. So with the use of generative AI, which of the skills do you think are more important for educators moving forward and which maybe aren't so important anymore? In terms of the skills that ChatGPT mm-hmm. or AI no, has? No, for, for national board certification, because you are you have a lot of skills you need to hit. So which ones do you think are important now and which ones are maybe not so important anymore? You know, I think... Uh... AI serves to do a lot of our data collection, you know, and those types of things. And that is one of the big hit points when they talk about it. It can analyze data, but I I always worry, you know, when we take the human out of some of these types of things. And you and I, I thought, had a really interesting conversation last night about the socio-emotional learning part of things, you know, and, and should we be using tools to write IEPs for students that are supposed to be individualized and personalized? And should we be using technology to, you know, to support social emotional learning? You know, hey, here's some questions it told me to ask you. Well, that's really pretty impersonal, you know. So even with that data collection piece of the national board certification, I think it it can lift the load for some of that stuff. But the whole part, the whole point of the national board certification journey isn't getting you to jump through hoops. It's getting you to reflect on your experience. I mean, every piece and every component in national board certification says, now reflect, do all this, now reflect, and do all this, now reflect. And so it's asking us to do exactly what I think we need to be doing with as teachers. We need to reflect, we need to discourse, you know, we need to have conversations. So yeah. I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but I didn't know because I've never been through the process. I'm learning as I go, but oh, it's such a reflective journey. I know that you obviously run the TED program and those are what I consider like a learning experience. Yes. You could prompt chat GBT to write a TED talk. I've, I've actually done it as a sample when Marina presented at the nice gate annual conference or TED talk. And we brought the unit back to our third graders. We needed a sample TED talk that was relatable. And then we had it write one. And then we had to rewrite one like an eight-year-old. Um, so we did get this one about oil spills and it used the word yucky and it was really cute. So I guess I know that it can write TED talks, but obviously, you know, that it's a very personal experience going back to the reflective part of your national board certification. So those are personal learning experiences. So now how do you see taking that in mind, the future of education, like what do you think like assessments in a classroom, the future of what education looks like? I think, I think education, especially assessment, it is going to have to change. You know, we can't, we can't skill and drill. And I think that happened personally. I think it's happening even before AI came on the scene. You know, I'm a science teacher, so I have next gen science standards and my standards are are inquiry based. You know, I start with the phenomenon and students have to make meaning of the phenomenon. And it's about their personal growth and through their understanding of the phenomenon and the science, they connect to it. You know, I'm not having them memorize vocabulary and I'm not testing them in all these different things. And I think that's where education is going to have to go. You know, we can't, we have these tools that can provide us all the information we need and can write anything that we need. So it is going to have to be more of a performance based, you know, maybe more of a, almost a kind of a Montessori, you know, Montessori style in, in a sense, I think definitely assessment is the big piece that's going to change the most. I, I do want to answer Tim's question here, though, because I think it's a good one. He in, asked in the chat about the uh, AI checking. I think that's going to be an important one in the breakout groups when we get there to talk about. Um, I use Check for AI when I've been using it. Um, I've had zero kids use it. None of them that I've caught have been using AI, you know, to, to answer questions on any of the homework assignments or the materials I've been asking them to do. Um, I know Turnitin just came out with a really, really good AI detector. Um, it's a subscription based. So if your district has Turnitin.com, they've got a good one that's now helping. Okay. So let's move right along into the breakouts. So you're going to self-select the breakout room of your choice. And there's some guiding prompts for you. And 
we ask that you just take a few notes because everyone that's not in your session is going to want to know what you talked about. So make sure you just take a couple notes of the highlights of the things that you discussed so that way um, everyone else can learn from what you talked about. We were just talking, um, you know, in our in our breakout, um, and I suggested um, a really neat article that I came across. It's actually a short story by Road Dahl, and it, it was written 70 years ago, if you think about visionary 70 years ago. And in it, he anticipates the impacts of AI on society and and, in a rather interesting way. So the title of the short story is The Great Grammatizer. And um, it's public domain at this point, so you can probably find it. But I'm going to send a link to Mary Beth um, of the PDF. And uh, it's really great for discussions. It's only, I think it's uh, maybe 14 pages long. And it's just interesting to use as almost like a a mini book study. You know, let's if you like to talk about literature and you want to talk about you know making connections, it's a really neat one. Yeah, there was another question in chat I noticed that didn't get answered. I wanted to address that. Go for it. Go. Someone was asking me about like organizing lists. They they mentioned they hadn't thought about that before and and hadn't used it. And you know, the the examples I have are are really pretty like basic, but it it was sort of an amazing thing. I had one example is, you know, I had this set of text that had tabs in between it. You know, it was it was a word, two tabs, a word, two tabs, a word, two tabs, you know, whatever. And it was just this formatted thing. And I wanted it in a column and I copied the list right out of there um, and popped it into chat GPT. And I asked it to alphabetize it and put it in a list in a table with, you know, separating every single cell and it was fast. So it's things like that, that you don't think of. All right. Are you ready for the book raffle? Going to click on a random number. The winner is number 19, Roseanne. Congratulations, Roseanne. You just won Mary's book. Congratulations. I yes, hope- I can reach out to you through email and um, get your address so that I can ship it off to you. I hope that you enjoy reading it now that you've virtually met the author. Now you can read the book. Maybe she'll even sign it for you if you're lucky. I think she will. And I just want to remind you that we're going to keep going. So ne- join us next time. Donnie Piercy, he's actually a fifth grade teacher. So we had Mary, who's a sixth grade teacher. And next we have uh, Donnie Piercy, who's a fifth grade teacher. He was the teacher of the year in Kentucky. He is, he's a keynote speaker. He has his own podcast. I think he might have multiple podcasts and he lives in Kentucky. So he's going to be joining us next time. And to register for that session, go to registration.generativeage.com. And we look forward to seeing you on June 5th at 7 p.m. for the next session with Donnie Piercy. To stay informed and up to date, we're going to keep having sessions at least one every month. And session titles might include things on ethics, academic integrity, curiosity, detection, assignment, redesign, bias, misinformation, and much, much more. So keep coming back. And we guide these sessions based on what you need. So if you have ideas, please let us know. Um, If you have ideas for presenters, please let us know. I scouted a new podcast guest and I can't tell you who it is yet because it's not confirmed, but it's a really big one. And I'm really excited to share it with you guys. So once I have a date, I will schedule it. But this one, that one is a really big one. Um, I, I was just lucky enough to bump into him. Um, Mary was great. And we really enjoyed learning from practitioners that are in the field. I think that's what's really important because a lot of us are in the field. So to hear from people like Donnie and Mary who are living it, where me, I'm an administrator, so I'm not in the trenches like you are, Mary. So it's always great to hear from, from you. And we just want to thank you, Mary, thank all of our participants for being here on a Monday at 7 p.m. because we keep doing this for you. So we're very glad that you're here and you're enjoying the sessions. And thank you, Nice Skate. And Cameron, do you want to jump in and say anything? Thank you. I just wanted to thank our presenter, Mary, and thank all of our attendees. Um, this is always exciting and it's just such a wonderful way to spend a Monday evening. So thanks to everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Generative Age, powered by NiceScape. We want to remind you that you can join us during the live recordings of these conversations and engage with like-minded colleagues. This is a great opportunity to ask questions, participate in back-channel discussions, and engage in breakout room activities to further your understanding of the topics we discussed. Stay informed about the latest developments in AI and education by following us on social media at generative underscore age. Join us next time for another exciting conversation. Until then, 
keep learning and keep growing in the generative age.